that people, people on the outside, they, uh, when you start talking about love to them, they don't understand God's love. They only understand their love, the love that they, that they practice, the love that they, that, they, um, that they present in their life, what they see. The problem is, is uh, in our English language, we only have one word for love. In the Greek, there's five. So whenever you start reading the New Testament, you know, and it says that God is love, well, it doesn't seem very loving when, you're, when, you say, when you start saying, well, God is love, but people will still go to hell. So what is really going on? What kind of love is that? And we're going to look at that today. So, um, and if you want to, if you want to reference First John four and eight, it says, "He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love." And you need to understand what love is to know God. But there's a, but there's those they don't love the way God loves, and that's very important whenever it comes to to be to the fundamentals of of being a Christian, a God fearer, a God believer, that. You know God because you love like God loves. And we're going to look at those things today. If you would, uh, would you pray with me, dear Lord, that you would just guide us in our understanding of your word and how to apply these things to our life. Uh, guide us in all these things. Help me, Lord, to be able to present your scriptures your way and to be able to help those who may not understand this to understand it better and those who do understand it to be able to to communicate it better. And I just ask, Lord, for the power of your Holy Spirit that you would just touch us uh, and fill us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so the first thing I want us to look at is the understanding of the English word love whenever it looks at, uh, whenever we look at the Greek, or at least the Greek understanding of love. The first one that, we, that I want us to think about is the, the word euros. Now, that is the love that you see just kind of just thrown out there by our culture. And it is a sensual or romantic love or desires. It's, it, it looks more like lust than it does love. Okay, that's, that's the sensual stuff. It comes and it goes based on feelings. That's Euros. And uh, the, now whenever you start looking at the, what the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches that love like this should be held in boundaries. That's the way that, the, that God has presented it. It's a love with boundaries. You take boundaries away from that and you've got, you've got chaos. You've got, you've, got, you've got things that look like Sodom and Gomorrah. You get things that look like uh, orgies in, in uh, the Greek worship centers. It's just, it, it turns into a madhouse. But God said, this type of love, I am giving, I, I am putting boundaries around it. And that is the type of boundary that comes with marriage. He gave, he initiated those with Adam and Eve. And Adam understood that. He said, that's why a man should leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. That's what the Bible teaches. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse, verse 5 and also 9. I'm not going to read all of the verses. I think Caden can put them up there for us. But it says in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, it says, defraud ye not one another. Well, that's that kind of deals with this. You're supposed to have a, a spouse in your life under God's provision of marriage that, you know, you have, you have a, a port for that type of sensual activity. And in verse 9, it says, but if they cannot contain, if they, if they lack self-control, like their emotions just kind of get overwhelmed them, they can't control, he, Paul says, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. And what he means to burn with this lust. And here's the deal. If you burn with that lust in your life, you're going to burn in hell fire. Christians, one of the, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, the fruit of the Spirit, part of it is self-control. And you don't lack self-control. Self You've got to wonder, well, do you have the fruit of the Spirit? You can't segregate and say, well, you know, I've got a lot of faith, but I just don't have any self-control. I would say, well, you can't have just part of the Spirit. 
You either have all or none. It's kind of like an apple. You can't have, you can't have an apple without the stem and the core, the blossom, the, the, the peel on the outside, the meat on the inside, the seed on the inside. You, you, you can't have an apple if you don't have those things. You can't have the fruit of the Spirit if you don't have all of the fruit of the Spirit. Does that make sense? So when you, when you get into our current modern Christian, per se, they're like, well, I've got these things, but I don't have that. Are you realizing what you're saying? You're thinking of a love that is not what God is. Your rose is not God's love. Does that make sense? He gave it to us. It is a gift used in boundaries. Proverbs 5, verse 18 and 19, <clears throat> he would say, Let that fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at, at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. So here it is. In the boundaries, in Proverbs, God says it's okay in marriage. It's not okay outside of marriage. That is God's standard, not mine. You've got a problem with it. You've got to take it up with your creator and the author of this scripture. The problem is, is that when you get to heaven one day, you're going to be judged by this standard right here. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what any other preacher thinks. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your family thinks. It doesn't even matter what your church thinks. The church is not the author of God's scripture. God is the author of his scripture. And he said these things, not me. I just, my job is to make sure that you know what God said in his word. And he has put this in boundaries. The second Greek word that means that we have translated into love is filio. This is an advent affection and feeling. It's an impulse. It's a brother love, like deep friendships. In the New Testament, the, Jesus would say, you know, there, this is how the world knows that you're my disciple, because you have love one for another. That's what he's talking about. This type of love, John chapter 13 and 35, it says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. That's that verse I just quoted, that you have love one to another. John 21, 15, and 16 would say it like this. So when he had done, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. The only problem is there's two different loves right there. When Jesus says, do you love me? Lovest you thou me more than these? Jesus says, do you agape me? And Peter says, I Filio you. I have this brotherly love for you, but the agape, we're going to talk about that in a second. Peter was struggling. He was struggling with an agape love. That's the fifth one we're going to talk about here in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but you need to know that Peter struggled with this, and he understood Greek. So us English speakers, we're going to really struggle with love because, you know, we, you know when, we, when we start using that phrase, well, Sometimes people they love they love their they love their spouse like they love pizza. They don't, there's no difference to them. But in the Greek, there's a different word for these. And God says that I am love, but I'm not the filial love. I'm not the Euros, I'm not the filial. There's another one that's called storge. This is like family love. It's the bond between parents and children and brothers and sisters, and it's almost um you know, you're obliged to love like that. Like, you know, I, I, I kind of have to love my, my kids. Some, you know, sometimes, like yesterday, I got mad at them. But I still, you know, I'm like, well, I still got to love them even though I got mad at them. Uh, Y'all have never been like that, have you? Yeah, everybody's been like that. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the story. We see this in the story of Jacob and his brothers. You know, they... It's like you, you got such a messed up family, but they still kind of loved each other, even though they try to kill each other sometimes. You know, that's that story. That story. Now, we have another one. It's kind of a combined. It's a filio story. Uh, it's a com combination of filio and, and the story. In Romans 12, 10, we get kind of this expression where it says, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. So it's kindly affectioned. It's preferring 
one another. Like, those are the type of people that you like to be around. You're at Bethany Baptist Church today because you kind of like being around us. Because there's a lot of other churches you could have went to this morning. Or you might be like most of Jonesboro, like, well, I don't like being around that group of people at all. So I'm just not going to church. You know, that, I get it. I, 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 don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to accept that. But I do understand that that is the Filio Storge version. That that is your people, the people that you, you like to be around. Those are the ones most like you. They agree with you and your thinking processes the most. That's what this is. This is what this word is signifying. That you prefer that type, that group of people. But it's not Euros. It's not just the Filio. It's not just the Storge. It's kind of a combination of where well, they're almost like brothers and sisters and you know and there's and there's a and there and we're friends at the same time so that's what that's what that word means now the fifth one and this is going to be kind of the the main part of today <clears throat> is really understanding this agape love this is the love that is divine love it's not impulse feeling like euros is it's not off of lust it's actually immeasurable. You, you just can't measure this agape love. It is, it is inco incomparable to any other thing. So that's why you get, when God says that, I, that God is love, he is agape. He's agape love. So what does that mean? That means it's a special kind that only can come from God Almighty. All right? Are y'all still tracking with me? Agape love is what comes from God. You can't love agape love unless God is with you. Unless that Holy Spirit is sealed inside of you. Now you can exhibit some traits similar to it sometimes, but to always be in that type of love, that's from God. That comes with being born again. That comes with the changed nature that God gives to his people. Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 25, or I'm sorry, verse 35 through 32. Here it is that this is, this is different from what we described as love in the, in the bounds of marriage. But this is a love when you are really getting to know your spouse. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it. I'm not going to read all those verses, but I just want you to consider that just for a second. He says, husbands, love your wives, agape style, not just under a feeling. You know, I, I'm sure my uncle, uncle wouldn't mind me talking about it, but he was married to somebody one time, and... Uh, after about 10 years of marriage, she wanted a divorce. And she said, I, I just don't love you anymore. You're more, I, do, I do love you in a sense of like my brother. She understood that type of love. But it's like the, the zing was gone or whatever she thought was supposed to be there. The problem is, is that God says you're supposed to step beyond the zing part of your relationship. And there's supposed to be something else. There's supposed to be a God-like love there a god that you husbands you love your wives even as christ so loved the church and gave himself for it think about that just for a second what did god what did christ do for the church well well first off we're talking about somebody who was in the paradise of heaven who said who who formulated the plan i'm going to become flesh and I'm going to go down there to that pain-stricken, suffering world where I know they're going to uh, uh, hate me. I know they're going to abuse me. I know they're going to torment me. I know they're going to reject me. I'm going to, I'm going to go down there for you. That's what Christ did for the church. And God says, husbands... You need to tap into this type of love, and you need to be able to exhibit this trait to your wives. Yeah, of course, it needs to go on the second, on the other side too. But it's like 
It can, but the Apostle Paul something, saw something in men where he said, you need to be able to show God-type love to your, your wives. And this is just a clue as to what it means to, be, to have agape love in your life. If you continue on those verses, what you're going to find out is you're going to find out that God wants you to be outgoing. He wants you to be outgoing for your spouse. Not the, not the person who, who, who sits in front of the TV all the time, flipping through the channels and not helping around the house. That's, that's not him. That's not agape love. It's not the one that won't, that, that won't give attention whenever it's, when, it's, when it's needed. It's selfless. That's what you'll find out in these passages too. It's selfless. What does it mean to be selfless? Well, that means that you're not thinking about yourself. You want to know, is there, does my spouse need help? It's agape love. You're stepping outside of your comfort zone. Oh, it, may not be, it may not feel good to do that type of job, but it's selfless. You do what you need to do despite how you actually feel about it. You're selfless. You serve. You know, if you've ever been in military service, you understand they, they want, they uh, highly encourage you to present these types of, of traits, don't they, Brother Bob? They, if, if you don't exhibit those traits, well, you don't have a place there in the military. You're supposed to treat the military like it's your spouse. You're supposed to be totally self-giving. You've got to trust. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be anything in your life that's not transparent. Are you, you trying to hide something from God? That's not agape love. You're trying to hide something from your spouse? That's not agape love. That's something else. So there's trust that just kind of, it, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And I get it. If you have trust issues, I understand trust issues. I really do. But I also understand this about it. Those aren't from God when I have those trust issues. God helps me. God helps me with that, especially when it comes to my wife. And God says, that is a clue on how your relationship is supposed to be with me. This is who I am. And I'm going to put some trust in, in you. And you've got to trust and you have to trust him the same way. And you're others oriented. You're not all about yourself. That's a God they love. That's who God is. He is others oriented. Why did Jesus Christ come and die for your sins? Because he cared about your eternal destination. Was God worried about his eternal destination? No. Was he worried about the angel's eternal destination? No. He was worried about your eternal destination. Everything that he has done is for you. As you read through from Genesis to Revelation... What you see is a God who is, who is others-oriented. The whole thing paints the picture of God reaching into your life, trying to bring you closer to him all the way in the book of Revelation. How many times, have you ever looked in the book of Revelation and said, how many times that it, 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 it reaches into this, it says this phrase, but they repented not of their sins. I think it's at least three times. Isn't it Brother Comer? At least three times it, it says. But they would not repent. What does that tell us? God is reaching into their lives. Even during those horrible. Last of the last of the last days. And trying to get them. <laughs> trying to get them. To the point where we. Would accept God's agape love. That's what, the, that's what this is about. He is others-oriented. So God is outgoing. He's selfless. He serves. He trusts. And he's others-oriented. That's what agape is. When it says God is love, those are some clues as to what he is. But there's some other traits, too. In John 15 and 13, it, he's, the scripture says it like this. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Do you understand what that's telling us? Agape love. When it says God is love, that means that God, this is Jesus speaking too. He says, 
There is no greater type of love than this, than the one who's willing to lay down his life for his friends. Now, the friends may be like Peter, and they just fill up. They just, you know, I just, I just kind of love you, Lord, like, a, like, you're, um, like you're one of my friends, maybe like a brother. But to self-sacrifice for you? Peter says, I'm not there yet. But God says, my agape love is that even though you may not accept me yet, I will die for you nonetheless. That's agape love. That's what we're that's what Jesus that's what God is talking about when first John mentions that God is agape love. Look again in first Corinthians. Chapter 13, if you want to, I think everybody should turn to this passage if you have your scriptures. Just a few verses that I want us to look at verses four through eight. Here it says charity. That this is agape love, this type of. Is And here the scripture refers to it not as love, but as charity. Because it has a little bit different thing. It says, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. It doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. What is he saying here? Agape love looks like charity in chapter 13. And here, you know, here, this is, this is for free to those who may be, who may be married one day. That future person, you should just stick their name right here. You know, does it say, does it say, Josh suffereth long? I'm just picking a little bit. But it could. Whoever, whatever their name is, stick it in there. Do they fit? If they don't fit right there, guess what you're going to have problems with later on? Husbands love your wives, even as Christ so loved the church. And gave himself for it. You're going to have troubles there. So you, they, if they don't fit. There's going to be some issues later on. And God is trying to tell us. He's trying to show us through examples. What God. When it, what it means when God says that God is love. God is this charity right here. You can put, you can put God's name right there. And say, God suffereth long. God is kind. God envieth not. God vaunteth not himself. He is not puffed up. He does not behave himself unseemly. God is not seeking his own. God is not easily provoked. God thinks no evil. God rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. God bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God never fails. Everything else may fail in this world, but God will not. God is this type of love, agape love. So what does that mean? That until you have the Holy Spirit, how in the world can you exhibit this God-like trait? God wants you to exhibit it. He wants you to show this agape love. He has demonstrated. Romans tells us that. That while we were yet sinners, that God demonstrated his love for us in his life, his death, and his resurrection so that we would have an example to live by. So whenever we start looking at people and they're saying, well, I don't understand how a God who is love can let people go to hell. They don't under, fully understand love. Yeah, I've given you all these definitions of it, but there's one more. There's one more. Agape love demands justice. Let me express what I mean by that. Agape love demands justice. 
Husbands, if you love your wives and somebody does something bad to her, how are you going to respond? Are you just going to sit back and say, yeah, you're, you're just going to sit back and just let them do whatever? No. You're going to demand justice. If, they, if, if the system fails, you know, you're, you're not going to be satisfied. You're, you want the system to work. And you, and you know what the system understands? The system understands that if it fails to enact justice, that what they're going to have on their hands is a bunch of vigilantes. And you cannot govern with a bunch of vigilantes out there. The system has to operate under agape love. That's why God has instituted the governing bodies over us. That's what it means, is that he loves his people so much that he's, he's going to make sure that justice is promoted. Because agape love demands justice. It's a just treatment or behavior. It means it's a concern for justice, peace, a genuine respect for people. It's, it's, a, um, it's fairness, justice, fair-minded. You see, justice demands rewards for the works. That's agape love. That's part of its attribute. In John chapter 5 and verse 29, look, in that, look at that verse with me, will you? In John chapter 5. In verse 29, the scripture says, And shall come forth, and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of, damn, of damnation. In this parable, Jesus is he's given, he's given the final details of what's going to happen at the end. When everything is said and done, when there's time no more for anybody to give a decision, uh, when somebody dies, they are going to present themselves. The scripture tells us that in several different places. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They are going to present themselves before their judge. The one who operates off of agape love. The God who is love. But he's also just and they are going to be held accountable for the things that ha they have done whether they are good or whether they are evil they will give an account now i want you to think about something just for a second jesus who is god in the flesh agape loves this world and he knows something from the foundation of the world, he knew that every one of us were going to have a problem called sin and that we were going to have to deal with it. And he knew, looking at all of us, that there is no way that you will ever be able to pay that sin debt. The wages of sin is what? Death. There is only one way that you can pay for your sin. And that is the wage of death. You've earned it. That's what wage means. You've earned it. But God, who is agape loved, looks down at you and says, I don't want you to suffer the wage of death. And I have a gift for you called eternal life. It's a free gift. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. You just have to believe. In the one who's giving it. It's a free gift. Accept it. You know sometimes. I ask people. About this. And I'm like. You see that pencil? It's, isn't that a really nice pencil? Everybody would like this pencil right? Let's pretend for a moment. It's eternal life. And God puts it right there. It's all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And he says, I have a free gift for you. But that free gift doesn't do any good in the hands of the giver. 
you must accept it. You must take it yourself. And you know, you could, and you could take that gift and you, can, and you can say, man, I know eternal life's in there. You can know all about it. You can know all about Jesus. You can know all about him dying for your sins and being born of a virgin and rising again the third day. You can even know about his second coming. You can know all those things. But until you open up the gift and to begin using it, applying it to your life, all it is is a, is a gift from the giver. But you must be the receiver you must say yes. That's how you know. That's how you know. It's kind of like if you had, a, if there was, you know, we could use, a, we could use a, a, about a $30 trillion check to pay off our national debt. And somebody could come along and give it to our government. But if they wouldn't cash the check, it would never do them any good. And Jesus asked us, will you accept the free gift of salvation. Will you apply it to your life? This is how the scripture says that you apply it to your life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does that mean? It means it, look, it looks like this. Somebody who confesses with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that he is Lord. I believe that he is creator. I am giving him my life. This is life is no longer my own. I am giving it to him. I am self-sacrificing. I am a Roman 12, one person. That I am presenting myself as a living sacrifice to my creator. I am giving him everything. I confess him with my mouth. And I believe in my heart that God is who he says he is. And I'm going to live my life like I believe that he is who he says he is. And when the day comes that the judge is there and, and, and I stand before him, when the good and the evil stand before him and the, re, and the rewards are given, he'll look at me and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Why will he say that? It's not based on my righteousness. My righteousness is as a filthy rag. Whose righteousness is it? It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The one whose blood has covered my sins because it's by his blood that I have been made whole. That's why we sing the song. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? It's his blood. He is the one who cleanses me. Though my sins were as scarlet, they have been made white as snow. Though they were red as crimson, they, were, they are now made white as wool. Not because I am so good, but because he is so good and I have accepted him. He doesn't want to send anybody to hell. In fact, the scripture says that God does not want anybody to perish, but that all should have everlasting life and come into repentance. The repentance means, I agree with you, God. You're right. I've been wrong. And I confess you. And I call upon your name and let you save me because I can't save myself. If anybody goes to hell, it's not because... Of God. It's because of them. They rejected. The free gift. They rejected agape. Love. They rejected it. Can you imagine anybody. Who would. Who would, who would personally reject. The love of all loves. The love that would save their own souls. Yet they do. They do. They choose hell. God has made a heaven for you. Hell is for someone else. It's for the devil and his angels. It's not for you. And you have a choice. Heaven or hell. And that choice is going to be, depend upon, do you choose Jesus with your life? Do you choose agape love? Or do you reject it? That's what is going on with this question. Why would they do that? Psalms 28, verse 5. It says, because they regard not the works of the Lord. Can you imagine that? That we have so many people. They think they're okay, but they're not. And you know how I know they're not? They don't regard the works 
of the Lord. They mean nothing to him. It means, it means nothing to them that Jesus died on the cross. It means nothing that God became flesh and dwelt in this miserable place and suffered the same things that we did. It means nothing to them. They don't care about the operation of his hands. Oh, he's put proof all over the place of his wonders and of his greatness. Yet they say no. We don't care what God thinks. We only care what we think. And if that's your choice, then it's not God who's sending you to hell. You're sending yourself to hell. Hell is not for you. Heaven is for you. And God wants to build you up. God is love. Let me ask you something today. Do you know God like that? Do you know the God of love? Agape love? We're not talking about all those other types of love. We're talking about God is agape love. And he doesn't send people to hell. They choose to go there by rejecting their Savior. We y'all stand and pray with me? Dear Lord, I just thank you for being so good. I thank you for your wonders. And that you would just help us with all the things that, that we do. And that you would just guide our understanding. And that you would help this generation to know that you really are love. And I just ask, Lord, that you would help us to be able to act on your love, to act like your love. Lord, whether it's, whether it's we're, 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 we're spouses in a, in a marriage or, we, or we're acting in our, in our country. Lord, we see so many people that do not know you. Lord, would you help us to show your agape love in everything that we do? So I just ask, Lord, that you would just guide us in these things. Help us to have this understanding. Help us to apply these things to our life. And if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, let today be the day that they call upon your name and let you save them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.